I first came to be involved with experimental music in school. Uh, I was at a co-educational boarding school um, in Yorkshire called Ackworth, and there was one wing which just had a lot of little pianos, uh, sorry, a lot of little rooms with pianos where people were supposed to go and practice their scales or whatever, and I actually went and just uh, started to make music with the piano that expressed what I was feeling. I had had some piano lessons, but in fact I was more interested in forgetting what I'd learnt already in, as a eight-year-old and rather just making the sounds that you know spoke to me and to my emotional state at that time. And I think it's a great luxury, in a sense, not to have a musical education because it allows you to make a direct connection between your kind of heart and your soul and the sounds that you make whereas the more discipline you've had to employ or had employed on you to to learn the, the craft of, of, of musical technique the more that actually delimits the sort of freedom of expression between between your hand and your soul if you know what I mean in school we, we had a couple of concerts and our band was called Pulsing Vein, which some people would relate in some way to Throbbing Gristle, but uh, it was kind of a, one of those coincidences. I'm sure that all of the staff were bemused by our concerts because that involved kind of tape recorders going backwards and cut-ups and things. Probably before we'd heard of William Burroughs or, or read about his experiments along those lines. Throbbing Gristle was my first band, and, and, and Tichi came about because uh, I was part of a performance art collective called Coombe with Genesis and Cozy, and we decided that the art world was too kind of up its own arse really and refined, and we wanted to, to, to bring our message to young people who would be more willing to go to a concert than they would be to go to an art show, and so that's why we started Throbbing Gristle. And we kind of finished Robin Gristle because we felt that it had become a pastiche of itself and we'd taken it as far as we wanted to take it without it becoming some kind of demon or beast that that was not totally within our control. So we finished that and various sort of different personal clashes and so on were going on within the band, uh, which caused Chris and Cozy to, to um, set up their own thing. And Genesis and I wanted to to work more in the world of, of television and kind of pirate TV, which, but we didn't really have the technology at that time to certainly not to broadcast. We started to do some uh, pirate videos of you know pirate underground kind of videos, and almost by accident we ended up doing music under the name of Psychic TV as well as doing TV under the name of Psychic TV, which was the original intention. Uh, John Balance, who I know as Jeff and I were, were part of Psychic TV, the music cooperative, as was David Tibet and various other, various other people who became subsequently famous. And it became clear to us that although we were kind of espousing a kind of free-thinking uh, type of philosophy, that Genesis at the time wanted to wanted to uh, go further into the role of being a, a cult leader with the Temple of Psychic Youth, which was another of our mutual creations. <clears throat> and so so Jeff and I left Psychic TV because we weren't comfortable with that, and we started COIL in 83, I think, 1983. I, I was initially reluctant to, to start a third band because I wasn't sure how we could do something that was new, but gradually, and with the technology arriving of uh, Fairlight and so on, it became clear that we could do something that was new in that direction, and Jeff was very keen not having done all that much to 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 um, pursue a musical career. I suppose it is true that Robin Gristle and Coil were or continue to be influential in certain circles. What I hope the the main influence of those bands is to show people that you don't necessarily need three chords to start a band, as as they always used to say in the punk days and that it didn't matter really what training you've had as long as you have inspiration and as long as you have willingness to work and a willingness to to make uh, editorial judgments about what you do because the main 
The main difficulty with people who who want, want to make music that sounds like Robin Gristle or like Coil is that they don't make enough editorial judgments about what's good and on whether it could be better and how to make it better. So there's you know there are quite a lot of so-called industrial groups that I can't listen to because it seems like they haven't tried hard enough somehow. Which is not to say they're not good, but but they're just not for me. Am I surprised about the legacy? Well, I don't know really. Yeah, I suppose I am. I just did always seem to me that one should you know think of something that what one wants to do and and pursue it as far as one possibly can to you know make it as good as one possibly can and that just seemed like obvious to me but but um i don't know the the nicest the nicest thing about the legacy is is all the mail actually that, that that we get and even with coil for example we used to get loads and loads and loads and loads of of emails and letters from people saying i might tell you positive i think i'm going to die soon your music's made my life you know a bit more bearable and it, you know when you get those letters it's hard not to you know feel sort of humble and 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 you know grateful that that we were able to to bring those that you know f feeling of of uh, relief or belonging or or being a part of something greater than the individual that that's that's the best part of it really coil went through many many changes over 20 years the changes came about partly as a result of being very easily bored by what we were doing and and wanting to move on we never really wanted to repeat you know any of our records and make an, another one that sounded similar to the last one maybe that's that's another way to to make sure that your records stay fresh it's never to do the same thing twice uh and also the changes came about because of of changes in our personality you know in our interests uh, and our needs and and what have you during the late 80s I, it's true to say that we went out clubbing a lot and certainly took a lot of ecstasy and the main reason for that was w w I think we were struggling to find a kind of intimacy that didn't involve sexual contact as a consequence of the of the AIDS you know from from 84 to through to 2000 odd it, you know intimacy was regarded as you know with with fear really there you know whether there was a relationship between in and the idea of being truly uh, intimate with someone and the idea that that could kill you and so we, so the the summer of love and the whole ecstasy explosion in the late 80s was a way of of trying to find that contact without without uh, sexual contact if you know what i mean a consequence of of our ecstasy use was that jeff started to use alcohol to to recover well ecstasy is a drug that that can be fabulous at the time that you're on it but actually has increasingly long uh you know a long time to recover from and and, and jeff started to drink uh to excess when coming down basically the, the day after and the day after the day after and unfortunately his use of alcohol ex you know continued to ex increase and he, he found that he couldn't live without it or didn't want to live without it and even when we weren't taking any drugs which we didn't we didn't take very many drugs after the early 90s i don't think so he became alcoholic and although he wasn't terribly pleased with the idea of being alcoholic or the actual practicality of it you know or the need to buy several bottles of wine to start with and then subsequently several bottles of vodka a day as things went on nevertheless he still preferred the comfort that it gave him to the discomfort of not having it he went into rehab a few times the first time that we were, that was relatively successful he was he stayed off for about six months he had also implants and stuff to discourage him from drinking excuse me but without success and and so from the beginning of the 21st century onwards when we started to tour it was kind of a constant struggle between the the, the the dominance of the booze or the dominance of of his willpower to to perform relatively straight and to perform well I, I became kind of not only the sort of leader of the band but also the nanny you know who had to look after him when he was drunk and stuff which was quite boring this came to a sort of a head really in around uh, in around 82 83 i think we went to have sushi and he announced that we were split up we were no longer a couple 
which was in some way a relief for me, but in other ways, at the same time, nothing changed. He continued to live in that, you know, the house we shared and to need to be babysat and when he was drunk and to, uh, to you know, be drunk when he wanted to be drunk, which was most of the time. So did his death come as a shock? Well, it, it, yes, it came as a shock, but it didn't come as a surprise. Uh, obviously, you know, we've been together for a long time, and so it was a big, uh, big jump to find that, uh, you know, I was um, alone again, or as it were. But uh, it didn't certainly didn't come as a surprise because we've been telling him that if he didn't stop drinking, it was going to happen for a long time. He, you know, he leant out too far into, in his desire to look into the abyss. And and if you do if you do genuinely desire to look into the abyss, then then it's more or less inevitable that you know if you don't take the proper precautions of hanging on, that you're going to fall. Uh, this is about Coyle's dark ambient style. Well, I don't know. I just, I I just have a very low threshold of boredom you know I, I, if, if some, sometimes you can put a record on and it's a drone or a rumble that goes on for a long time and it's fine and it serves its purpose and the music that I play now is relatively con- you know more or less conventional either it's like uh, Boards of Canada or it's like local kind of weird folk music or whatever I, I don't know it depends what you want your music for. If you want your music to just f- fill in the sort of gaps, then it's okay if it's a rumble for uh, for half an hour. But I, I personally find that boring. I like music to do a bit more, and so I tend to, to try and make it more interesting or to make do more unexpected things or whatever. I think it's just about the one threshold of boredom, really. Yeah, current, my current project, as you probably know, is the Threshold House Boys Choir, which. I had discussed with Jeff, you know, even before his accident, and and he thought it was a good idea. And that, as some of people may know, it doesn't really necessarily involve a conventional choir as such. And I've decided to do most of my vocals within the computer. If my vocalist crashes again, I'll have a backup. So that's what I'm working on, using all different kinds of voices. Some some voices are sampled, some are totally, you know, electronically generated. Some are me, but manipulated. It starts to sound a bit more interesting than I do. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on. I have a project with um, Ivan Pavlov uh, of COH. Uh, he makes more kind of um, brutalist electronic kind of music, and, and we plan to work together next year, hopefully. But uh, I'm not saying any more about that right now. The reason that I released the, the combined DVD and CD of, of the Threshold House Boys Choir was because bits and pieces of the video had started to appear on YouTube and, and in various other places that were, that were just sort of shot on people's phones at, at the two, two or three shows that I'd done where the video was played, including one in the Brainwashed Festival in uh, whenever it was last year sometime. And... Uh, I didn't want the f- the first time that people saw the video to be in not very good quality and, and crappy handheld uh, off the screen re- reshot stuff. So I decided to to release it as a uh, you know as a proper thing. All the reviews that I've that I've seen and all of the, the comments that I've seen about this work have been overwhelmingly positive and and um, appreciate. I don't know whether to say that the the you know it's a soundtrack to a film or whether. The uh, the film is an accompaniment as a video that goes with the music. I don't, I don't, neither of them came first, really. They were both simultaneous. And so uh, it's hard to, to describe what kind of a work it is. It's, it, the footage is documentary, and it shows the Ginche Festival in, in the south of Thailand, which is designed basically to scare away malign spirits and to bring um, merit to the community. But in doing the way that they do that is in relatively gory sort of way. So a bunch of, um, in this case, sort of low-class, working-class type kids go into trance and, and um, do various gory things, putting metal through their cheeks and all that stuff and cutting their tongues with straight razors and things like that. But, but what you will find is that although that sounds sort of horrifying and disgusting and heavy, you'll find that the film that I made of it is actually quite uh, slow and beautiful and co- complicative, if there is such a word. Um, the music, likewise, 
takes you further towards the the kind of spiritual state that I believe that these boys achieve for themselves as part of the ritual which is a, a kind of elevated uh, state of, of um, what's the word, spirituality or whatever. The, the reason that I put the, the CD in, in the package was because I wanted people to be able to listen to the music without having to watch the film if they didn't want to um, because it's not, not suitable for every occasion and I wouldn't necessarily encourage people to show it to their kids and so on uh, without you know, due explanation and warning and so on. I think it's a you know, work of, of, of beauty and calm and peace but that's in contrast, in great contrast, the actual appearance of the images, which is what's interesting about it for me and, and hopefully for other people too. The Ape of Naples uh, was a title that, that Jeff and Simon uh, also known as Ossian, came up with. Uh, Simon used to work in a in a porno store in in Soho in London. The, there used to be an array of VHS tapes on the on the counter that hunters could select, and the titles, you know, were were hand written on the spines of these tapes. And Jeff and Simon always used to make up imaginary titles for their own amusement of these gay hardcore porn films. And The Ape of Naples was one such title. I think, actually, Black Antlers was another. So, so uh, both of those titles originally were intended to be porn films, but, but ended up as coil albums instead. And after Jeff died, I decided that um, the, you know, there was this material that was outstanding that had never been on the coil album that was developed mainly for, for live shows, but also, you know, ultimately to be released as a record. And so I mixed that material... Uh, in the months after his death, and and I think that accounts possibly for the intensity and the the, the fact that people find it kind of so so moving. Some of the tracks were from the session that we recorded in New Orleans at Trent Reznor's studio. For a while, I lived in Los Angeles, and at a party once, Trent and his manager said, "You know, we're building the studio in New Orleans. Why don't you come down and use it?" So I said, "That would be lovely." <laughs> To the best of my knowledge, we were the only band that they didn't actually charge proper studio rates for. I'm pretty sure they charged Marilyn Manson, you know, the going rate. But quite got it for free, which I'm glad to say, because we could never have afforded it if we'd had to pay. The music that we made at the time in, in New Orleans was... We, we felt it was kind of infected slightly with um, New Orleans-y kind of rock distortion sound that we weren't subsequently very keen on and there was just something about the songs that we recorded there directly that we felt we weren't happy with or that we didn't we didn't know why we didn't want to release them but we knew we didn't when I came to remix or to, to produce the Ape of Naples suddenly they seemed to be more pertinent or apt and so that, that, that tended to make the album more intense also I had lived in Thailand for several stretches of three or four or five, six, even six months at a time in the preceding few years, even before Jeff died. And I knew ultimately that I wanted to live here because it's just a much more pleasant place to live than England. There are lots of things I like about Thailand, not least the fact that I feel that the skin that separates the real world from the world of the supernatural, of, of uh, spirits, ghosts, all kinds of, of uh, creatures or visions, you know, from, from beyond this plane of existence. The skin is much thinner here in Thailand than it is in the UK. Generally speaking, in the UK, ghosts and visions of those kinds of... I don't know, they're, they're, they're kind of removed, they're lonely, they're, they're separate, they're mostly invisible to most people. Whereas here, you can talk to any taxi driver and he will tell you about ghosts that he's had in his cab. After the tsunami, there was a big phenomena amongst the taxi drivers in Bangkok. Um, many, many taxi drivers reported picking up Westerners from the train station or from from um, hotels, whatever, wanting to go to the airport and driving them to the airport and finding on arrival at the terminal that the, their cabs were empty. 
and they all the taxi drivers would, would swear blind and would tell you that, that, that it was because of the westerners that had died in the tsunami who were trying to get home or the ghosts or their spirits were trying to get home by by going to the airport so so take that with a pinch of salt or at face value as you like i don't like to become inebriated just to see across the divide i don't you know in the way that that jeff used to i don't need to you know drink i don't need to take drugs particularly to to see across and and that's one that's the main thing that i like apart from that the weather's gorgeous the food's gorgeous the people are gorgeous uh, and it's about a quarter of the price of living in england so i don't think i would say that coral was a gay band as such although obviously nearly all of the people that ever worked with us were gay or homosexual but we didn't identify with you know the as as Mark Holman said at his concert at the Wilton Music Hall, we might be friends of Dorothy, but we weren't friends of Elton, uh, which is kind of facetious, but it's also sort of true in the sense that we didn't we didn't identify with that that lifestyle. I think it's I think what we were for first and foremost was outsiders. It's a great advantage seeing things from the outside because you don't have to take everything you know all of the prejudices of the mainstream you, you can ignore all of them and that that spreads just not just about sexuality but about you know food or music or clothes or anything it's a, it's a fantastic advantage to be an outsider but at the same time you know you lose the protection of being in the middle but if given the choice i'd always rather be on the outside